This is the Human Being Human Podcast. 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 I feel this way about that Rose Bowl team. There were some people who were a little bit different, like any human being may be. But boy, you put us together like that. That was one fine group, one tough bunch of football players, one intense group of football players, all with the same aim. Come a-running, boys. Alan Zickman, or Nebraska native and University of Nebraska Cornhusker, class of 1942. In the year 1940, the Nebraska Cornhuskers found themselves ranked number seven in all of college football at the end of the regular season. The 1940 University of Nebraska football team, which included halfback Alan Zickman, of my hometown, Ord, Nebraska, was invited to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California to face off against Stanford University. This game, the Cornhuskers' first ever postseason appearance, was so momentous and historic that classes were canceled throughout the university as triumph and jubilee spilled out across campus and into the city streets of Lincoln. According to newspaper accounts, UNL students stormed the state capitol building, demanding that the governor lead in the singing of the school fight song. As that 1940 Nebraska team rode the bus to the Coliseum Stadium, they belted out their battle cry, Robert W. Stevens' 1909 song, The Cornhusker. Together in unison, the player sang out its triumphant line, Come a-runnin', boys, as the adrenaline and excitement reached a boiling point. The 92,000 fans who watched the January 1941 Rose Bowl made up the largest crowd ever to watch Nebraska play football up until then, and it would remain the largest crowd the Cornhuskers would play in front of until the teams returned to the Rose Bowl in 2002. Although the Cornhuskers were ultimately defeated by the Stanford football team in a close 21-13 game, thousands of Nebraskans gathered together at Lincoln's train station to welcome the players and coaches back with loving arms and roarious applause. Decades later, Hall of Fame head coach Bob Devaney told reporters that he had spent several years living in Nebraska before he learned that the Cornhuskers had actually lost the 1941 Rose Bowl. Even prior to World War II, Nebraskans were known, at least by themselves, as the best fans in college football. What makes Cornhusker college football worthy of such admiration and fanaticism. Am I just a corn-fed Nebraska meathead? Is there truly nothing else to do in my home state? If Nebraska has a mythology, it's that of the Nebraska Cornhuskers during our golden age of college football. And every fall, we celebrate our legends and heroes with thunderous gratitude and appreciation. Athletic events, like all human gatherings, function as trail markers along our lives' paths, helping us remember the who, what, where, and whens of our most important experiences. That's how I can tell you about the only time I've ever seen my grandfather cry. November 11th, 1998, when Nebraska lost to the Kansas State Mildcats 30-40. to My strongest and most powerful memories come from autumns spent in Nebraska, 
when the leaves turn golden orange and blanket the once green grass, and the days begin to shorten with every evening, and the smell of change and transformation hovers in the air. The fall breeze has a crispness to it that gives you butterflies in your stomach because it signals that Cornhusker football is about to kick off. When it comes to being a human being, there is no place like Nebraska. Welcome to the Human Being Human Podcast. I'm your host and creator, Carrington Modry Cooper. If you made it to this point and have decided this podcast isn't for you, you might as well stick around for this one. It's the last one of the season. Let's recap the series so far. Long ago, Nebraska was once very hot when it was formed by lava and volcanoes, and then it became very wet when it was submerged by seas. Then it got very warm when it was covered by forests and jungles. And then it got very cold when it was engulfed by snow and glaciers. Plains Native Americans arrived on Nebraska lands 10,000 years ago, and Europeans tore them off of their land 500 years ago. My Czech family made its home in Valley County, Nebraska, 150 years ago. No podcast series about Nebraska history would be complete without dedicating an entire episode to learning about Nebraska Cornhusker football. Nebraska athletics and academics have an intriguing and complex history, but they do go hand-in-hand and arm-in-arm. Nobody personified Nebraska athletics and academics more than Dr. Tom Osborne, who earned his doctorate in educational psychology from the University of Nebraska in 1965. This was the same year that the undefeated Nebraska Cornhuskers played for their first national championship against the Alabama Clemson Tide, coming in short 28 39. This 1965 team featured fullback Frank Solage, who went on to have a mediocre head coaching career at Nebraska. I'd like to begin this episode with one of my many unforgettable Husker experiences. On November 2nd, 2013, the Nebraska Cornhuskers found themselves trailing the Northwestern Mildcats 24-21 with only four seconds left in the ballgame. Myself and my now wife were just beginning to see each other, and we had only gone out a couple of times at that point. Both of us were hoping to celebrate that Saturday night on the town with all of our friends. But nobody was in the mood to party, given the dire circumstances of the game. And then... With only seconds left, third string, walk-on quarterback, Ron Kellogg III, threw a 49-yard Hail Mary pass to freshman Jordan Westerkamp, who caught the tipped ball for a touchdown, giving the Huskers a 27-24 victory. Known as the Westercatch, this miraculously lucky touchdown gave the entire state permission to eat, drink, and be merry. And did we ever, 
as all of our friends headed to downtown O Street in Lincoln, Nebraska to join in the jubilant festivities. Today, we're going to explore the first chapter of Nebraska college football. This story takes place during the first 50 years of our program's storied history, between the years 1890 and 1940. During those first five decades, Nebraska won 24 conference championships, completed six undefeated seasons, including a streak of 34 undefeated games, and had 13 seasons that contained only a single loss. Admittedly, ties were very common in this early era of college football, so many of these one-loss seasons contained one or more ties as well. It doesn't take the eyes of a hawk to see how silly it would be to claim any national championships from this wild, wild west era of college football. To claim any national championships from this archaic era, one would need the paws of a gopher to go digging that far into the past. The sport of American football has its roots in the historical and often violent competitions that human beings have sparred in for thousands of years. In modern times, the sport's origins can be traced to European football and rugby that found its way to America by the many immigrants that traveled across the Atlantic Ocean. During the 19th century, the modern game of college football was conceived in a time known as the Pioneer Period, figuratively, as the rules of the game were still evolving and developing, and literally, as this was still the era of forts and covered wagons, and cowboys and Indians. College football was born in the shadow of the American Civil War, when the sons and grandsons of war veterans found themselves in an era that was coming to a close. The West had been conquered, all of America's uncharted territories had been explored, and these United States of pre-Civil War had transformed into the United States. For a more in-depth look at the history of American football, I highly recommend the publicly funded podcast Radio Lab and their episodes, American Football and Ghosts of Football's Past. Free Government Stuff the greatest of all American traditions. In the year 1869, the same year that the first collegiate game of football was played, the University of Nebraska was established in the city of Lincoln, the state's capital. Beginning in 1890 to 1895, attendance at the university quadrupled in size from 384 students to over 1,500 in total. These were the sons and daughters of the immigrants that arrived on the 19th century Great Plains from Germany, Poland, Ireland, and of course, Bohemia. Living and studying on the Great Plains of Nebraska during the 1800s required tremendous determination and physical grit by the homesteaders of this period and these attitudes were reflected in their activities and institutions. The students and staff of the University of Nebraska felt their college held the same credibility and legitimacy as any East Coast Ivy League school, and the people of the Plains wanted to prove this to themselves and the state they were proud to represent. The story of the Nebraska Cornhuskers begins in the year 1890 12 years after my great-great-great-grandfather, Joseph Potoshnik, settled down in Valley County. In the fall of 1890, Dr. Langdon Frothingham, a newly employed veterinary pathologist from Harvard University, coached the University of Nebraska's very first college football season. Being from the East Coast, Dr. Frothingham was selected simply because he was able to bring a football along with him a rare sight on the 19th century Great Plains.
Nebraska's very first game of football, played as the Old Gold Knights, was a 10 to nothing Thanksgiving Day victory over the Omaha YMCA on November 27, 1890. The game was played in Omaha, Nebraska, in front of approximately 500 students who traveled the 55 miles between cities. This was Frothingham's only game that he coached, as he broke his leg during practice prior to the season's only other game, an 18 to nothing win over the Doan Tigers. This game took place on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1891, in Crete, Nebraska. An appropriate date to end the university's first season, as it was love at first sight between the people of Nebraska and their college football team. The following year, in 1892, the team name was changed to the fabled Bug Eaters of Nebraska after trying out several other unofficial names, including the Rattlesnake Boys, the Tree Planters, and the Antelopes. The name seemed to fit well with the people of the plains, embodying the willpower and toughness that Nebraska homesteaders were proud to represent in their team. In the middle of the season, Omaha attorney J.S. Williams began coaching the first official Nebraska Bug Eaters team. Williams' short coaching stint is notable for his first and only game, a one to nothing forfeit victory over the Missouri Tires. The battle lines of the Civil War were still fresh in the 1890s, and Missouri, the 12th state admitted to the Confederacy, refused to play Nebraska due to the presence of Nebraska's all-star player, George Flippin, an African-American. George Flippin was UNL's first African-American athlete, and he would go on to become a renowned physician, opening up the first hospital in Stromsburg, Nebraska. Famed Nebraska author Willa Cather attended the University of Nebraska during this time, graduating in 1895. As a student at UNL, she was a fervent fan of Nebraska football, and her fandom would rival any Nebraskan today. In 1893, as a writer for the university newspaper, Willa Cather wrote, A good football game is an epic. It rouses the oldest part of us. Poetry is great, only in that it suggests action and rouses great emotions. The world gets all of its great enthusiasms and emotions from pure strains of sinew. The pioneer spirit of grit, determination, and physical toughness that Willa Cather admired and articulated in her writing echoed throughout the state of Nebraska as the first dominant era of Cornhusker football commenced. My great-grandfather, William Modry, was born in the year 1900. That same year, the University of Nebraska hired Walter Bummy Booth, the first to coach the official Cornhuskers from 1900 to 1905. Bummy Booth rapidly transformed Nebraska's program into a Midwest football powerhouse. Between 1902 and 1903, the Cornhuskers won 24 straight games, setting a school record that stood until the 1994-95 seasons. The 1902 Nebraska Cornhuskers outscored its opponents 106 to nothing, not allowing a single score against them en route to completing a undefeated 10-0 season. Paying $3 a ticket, 3,000 fans traveled to Minnesota by train to watch the Cornhuskers beat the Minnesota golfers 6 to nothing. After the dominating 1903 season, one newspaper of the time wrote, Nebraska occupies a unique position in Western football. 
too strong to find fearful competitors. The Cornhuskers can almost weep with Alexander the Great because they have no more teams to conquer. And so this group of in-state walk-ons, playing for nothing but the love of the game, joined the Missouri Valley Intercollegiate Athletic Association in 1907, led by head coach W.C. Cole. The Huskers' 16-6 victory over the Kansas Drainhawks, their lone conference game, was enough to claim the MVIAA title in their first season. During W.C. Cole's four-year tenure at the helm, Nebraska played its first season at Nebraska Field, the university's first venue designed and constructed to host football games. In 1911, the Nebraska Cornhuskers hired Ewald Jumbo Steam as head coach. Despite his hot-headed temperament, his steamroller teams, as they were nicknamed, were highly successful on the field, winning the conference title each of Steam's five seasons and losing only two games during his entire five-year career. Under Steam's watch, Nebraska began a school record 34-game unbeaten stretch, and halfback Guy Chamberlain of Blue Springs, Nebraska, was named the first All-American in university history. The Nebraska Cornhuskers were feared by every football program in the Midwest, having defeated the other regional big league giant, the Minnesota Golfers, 7-0 in the fall of 1913. But what Nebraskans desired most was nationwide recognition for their football organization, and its university wanted the prestige and status and funding that comes with being on the national collegiate stage. The East Coast Ivy League schools, still the hallmark of college football during this time, were located too far away to travel by train in those days. The University of Notre Dame, however, was only a day's train ride away in Indiana, and their program had already established itself as a staple in college football. And so, Notre Dame traveled to Lincoln, Nebraska to play the Cornhuskers on October 23, 1915. While both teams came into the game undefeated, Nebraska hadn't lost a game since 1912, over three years prior. But at halftime of this heavyweight showdown, Nebraska trailed Notre Dame 7-13. However, Nebraska ended up defeating the Notre Dame Fighting Eilish by a single point, 20-19. Led by All-American Guy Chamberlain, Nebraska finished the 1915 season undefeated, and the Cornhuskers were invited to its first-ever postseason appearance, the 1916 Rose Bowl. In a tale as old as time, the University of Nebraska declined the invitation, insisting that the athletic program was beginning to take away the spotlight from the school's academic institutions. As Nebraskans are all too familiar with these days, there are times when a football season can be negatively affected by a global pandemic. Over 7,500 Nebraskans died from the Spanish flu, mostly young men in their 20s and 30s, while another 50,000 served in World War I, mostly young men in their 20s and 30s. All conference games were canceled that year as universities struggled to put together rosters and coaching staffs. The Nebraska Cornhuskers did manage to find a team to play in the abbreviated 1918 season. The Omaha Balloon School, an Army personnel group training to operate zeppelins and airships for the American war effort in Europe. College football 
exploded in popularity in the decades after the Spanish flu and World War I, and Americans found a new sense of energy and optimism not felt in years. The first stretch of coaching stability following these deadly and tumultuous times began with a hire of Fred Dawson in 1921. The Roaring Twenties started off with a roar for the Nebraska Cornhuskers as well, as the team faced off in a series of historical games against Notre Dame University. The Cornhuskers' 1922 matchup against the Notre Dame Fighting Eilish was the final game played at Nebraska Field. An estimated 16,000 fans witnessed the 14-6 Cornhusker victory, the largest crowd ever to attend a game at Nebraska Field. Thanks to Fred Dawson's compelling series of games against Notre Dame, Nebraska's love and admiration of football was becoming too big to be contained. Literally. In 1922, Nebraska began raising funds to construct a larger stadium on top of the old Nebraska field site. Memorial Stadium began construction in the spring of 1923 at a cost of $450,000, or approximately $5 million today, roughly equal to current head coach Scott Frost's annual salary. The brand new stadium was built with a capacity of 31,000 people, doubling what Nebraska Field could hold. The first game held at Memorial Stadium was a 24 0 Nebraska victory over the Oklahoma Sewers on October 13, 1923. I attended my first game at Memorial Stadium when I was in fourth grade. It was on that cold and foggy Halloween night that I witnessed the end of the fifth longest home winning streak in college football history in a 20 16 loss against the Texas Longhorns. In 2008, my sophomore year of college, I was fortunate enough to witness walk-on Alex Henry kick the longest field goal in Cornhusker history in a 40-31 win over the Colorado Ruffalos. Everything in the entire country was changing by the end of the 1920s, including Nebraska's football program. In 1929, the Nebraska Cornhuskers hired future Hall of Fame head coach Dana Xenophon Bible. Known more commonly by his Christian rapper name, DX Bible had a remarkable career as the Huskers head football coach, winning six Big Six titles in eight years at Nebraska. This era of Nebraska football was during a time period that was very bleak for the folks of the Midwest as they found themselves in the midst of the Great Depression. The people of the plains couldn't control the weather or the economy, but they felt they could gain some stability through the success of their football program. During those days, the team traveled by train across the Great Plains to their games and stayed in and out. Folks in every small town along the way would gather and line up at the railroad stops just so they could get a chance to wave as the team rode by and perhaps catch a glimmer of hope for the future. During the most desolate times of the 1930s, Nebraska's football program was a beacon of light amidst the dust and debris. After a 13-9 victory over the Indiana Losers, DX Bible's 1936 squad found itself ranked number 15 in the first ever Associated Press Pool, and the Cornhuskers completed the season ranked number 9 in the entire country. However, the only bowl that the Nebraska Huskers experienced in the 1930s was the Dust Bowl. <laughs> Running back Sam Francis of Dunbar, Nebraska, 
finish the 1936 season as the runner-up for the very first Heisman Trophy. Although the winds and dust still raged and roared around them, Nebraska Cornhusker football helped guide the people of the Plains through the turbulent 1930s. D.X. Bible stepped down from Nebraska after the 1936 season, and per his recommendation, Nebraska hired Major Lawrence McCheney Jones, better known as Biff. In the fall of 1939, Nebraska's 25-9 victory over the Kansas State Mildcats was broadcast locally in the Midwest, making this matchup the second ever televised college football game. Nebraska football had literally become a shining light during the darkest days of the Dust Bowl and Great Depression. The first 50 years of Nebraska's football program bloomed into fruition during the 1940 season when the Nebraska Cornhuskers found themselves ranked number seven in the country with an invitation to the 1941 Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. Travel packages were offered to the 25,000 Nebraskans who made the trip out west, with the total cost of train tickets, hotel arrangements, and admission to the game, after taxes, service fees, and convenience charges. 58 bucks. The 1940 Nebraska Cornhuskers featured halfback Alan Zickman, who grew up in the same extraordinary, ordinary place I did, or in Nebraska. Born on March 26, 1922, on a homestead near Ord, Alan graduated from Ord High School 68 years before I did, in 1939, and was a starting player for the undefeated Ord Chanticleer football team. Alan Zickman went on to attend the University of Nebraska at Lincoln from 1940 to 1942, earning an education degree while playing halfback for the Cornhuskers. Nebraska was the first to score against the Stanford football team, shocking the number two ranked squad early in the Rose Bowl matchup. Halfback Alan Zickman caught a second quarter touchdown reception, giving Nebraska the lead. However, the Nebraska Cornhuskers would lose a heartbreaking matchup 21 to 13 in their very first nationally televised bowl appearance. Even with this loss, the future looked bright and promising for Cornhusker football and the people of Nebraska. Thousands upon thousands lined the snowy streets of Lincoln as their boys returned home, giving the players and staff the hero's welcome they all deserved. But as the parties continued up and down O Street, the ominous and threatening clouds of war hung over the entire world. The following 1941 season, the Nebraska Cornhuskers lost five consecutive games for the first time ever in school history. Just one week after the final game of the season, Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, and only a few days later, Coach Biff Jones was recalled to serve in World War II. The effects of the American war effort would soon be felt by the university's football team, as thousands of young men were drafted for overseas duty to aid in the war effort, many of them in their 20s and 30s. The Nebraska Cornhuskers would struggle to match the achievements of the first 50 years of the program, completing only three winning seasons in the 20 years after World War II. The highest ranking officials in the U.S. military, men born in the wild, wild west of the 1880s and 90s, would completely throw out the playbook of war, as the top scientists of the time were ordered to manipulate the very fundamental fabric 
of matter and energy itself to assure an American victory. And so, this pioneering era of college football came to an end, and the people of the plains would find themselves in a brand new paradigm of what it means to be a human being human. It is here where we leave off our story. The United States would fight in World War II until August of 1945, when two of the most powerful weapons ever constructed by human beings were dropped on Japanese populations. What if a football team had a player that was so powerful and so efficiently dominant of their opponent that it threatened the very existence of the sport itself? In the aftermath of World War II, for the very first time in human history, the major powers of the world found themselves in such a stalemate. Not because of war, diplomacy, or peace, but because the only weapon left to utilize would threaten the very existence of the planet itself. Following the end of the first Cold War in the early 1990s, Nebraskans found themselves in a veritable utopia as the Nebraska Cornhuskers produced one of the greatest stretches in all of college football history. Between 1993 and 1997, Nebraska played in four national championships, winning three of them, and lost only three games in that entire five-year span. That happens to be when this Southern Californian moved to Nebraska at the beginning of my preschool year. But all of this came crashing down in the year 2001 and the attacks of 9-11. The utopia of the 1990s was over and the war on terror was about to kick off. The following year, the Nebraska Cornhuskers would finish the season with the first non-winning record since 1961 officially closing this chapter in Nebraska college football history. Thanks once again for listening to the Human Being Human podcast. I'm your creator and host, Carrington Modry Cooper. Please join me for the next season, and we'll see each other on the other side. You can follow this podcast on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Patreon. I'll be posting links to all the references mentioned throughout this series, as well as any other stories, videos, articles, or other cool and nifty stuff that might be of interest. Today's episode featured music by the great Alexander James and his song, Cliff Gazing, Battles Lost and Won. As always, I appreciate all of your ears and support. This is not the last time you'll be hearing from me.